who knows LTOPC already and who doesn't. So put your hands up if, you, if you've got no knowledge what the hell's going on here. <laughs> Identify yourselves now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a minority but an important minority. So we'll have to do the basic historical stuff quickly. So LTOPC is a group that was created in 1979 in Ruma in a small town in Serbia, or then Yugoslavia. And Rum is interesting because it's in Vojvodina, which is already a, not Serbia proper. It's going towards the Hungarian border. It's already got a slightly different uh, cultural identity, a bit more German-influenced. And until 1945, there was a German community there. Uh, there's a German cemetery in the town, lots of German traces. And they were still there, but the Germans weren't. So. This is a provincial town, and the people involved in Altopsia are, are growing up there. And also there are family connections, because the grandfather of the main member studied in Vienna as an engineer. So you'll see not so much in these works, but in some Altopsia works, you'll see details of Austrian technical diagrams and technical catalogues and the machinery. And that's all coming from that Austrian 1920s, 1930s, technical background. Then 1945, obviously the Germans within Yugoslavia have to leave in a hurry. Um, so there's officially that Central European history isn't talked about so much anymore. That disappears from the record. But it's there. It's there in the cemeteries. It's there in the old textbooks. It's there in the libraries. It's still around. So there is that. And Yugoslavia, for those of you who don't know, uh, was not the Eastern Bloc. So it was very open. So people in Altopsia, other people in Slovenia, they could come here to London in the late 70s and they could buy records and they could go to concerts. So they could see the Sex Pistols of a 100 Club. They could buy a Throbbing Gristle record. They could see Throbbing Gristle in concert. They could experience the apocalypse culture that was happening here. And at that time, Yugoslavia was still stable on the surface. There were under the surface, there were all sorts of tensions, and they were borrowing huge amounts from the IMF. So there was always already a potential for trouble. But on the surface, Yugoslavia was far less trouble than Britain was at that period. Britain, you had the strikes, you had the rubbish in the streets, you had punk, you had chaos. Hackney, for those of you who are not old enough to remember, Hackney at that time was pretty much a war zone. looked like some dystopian film. It may again in about 10, 15 years, let's see. But coming from Yugoslavia and experiencing that chaos and all the, the cultural action going on here, that struck some chords and people began to think, what can we do? And there's another industrial group which came from Slovenia, I think. Um, can't remember what they're called, but they had a similar <laughs> experience. <laughs> and what Yugoslav artists and musicians had to think about was like I said, Yugoslavia was very open, so it had an official modernist culture. And the Yugoslav monuments, the architecture that's become really fashionable in the West in the last four or five years, is really incredible space age futuristic constructions, which look like they've just been down from some of the advanced civilization. And you have very, very advanced intellectual culture in Yugoslavia, because Yugoslavia was desperate not to be the Eastern Bloc and to show how modernist it was, how radical, how tolerant. And so all sorts of books were translated. You know, tra books which could never have been published anywhere else in the state socialist system, you could easily get. You could get Nietzsche, you could get Oswald Spengler, you could get uh, texts on alchemy, all sorts of stuff which just wouldn't be allowed in, a, in another system. So you have that, and you have the potential for disaster because of the still simmering ethnic tensions. You have the arsenals everywhere. You have arsenals and libraries, basically. So incredible libraries, incredible architectural structures. And one of them, which I'll talk about a bit more later, but one of them was Tito's bunker, Konyets in Bosnia. And that was built between 1955 and was completed in 1979, just before Tito died. And that probably took at least 10 to 15% of the Yugoslav budget. Massive, massive 
uh, bunker that would have housed 300 people for six months after a nuclear war. So really megalomanic. So you've got that as well. You've got the radical culture, you've got the intellectual culture, and you've got also at uh, Zhelyeva, there was an underground air base with a squadron of MiG-21s inside a mountain that would be brought up on caves, Thunderbird style. So, you know, really incredibly advanced <coughs> and megalomanic. So there's all that. But anyway, if you're, if you're an artist in, that, in those conditions, in between East and West and with access to all this information <coughs> and being able to travel to here and to Germany, see what's going on, what can you do creatively? Because you can't be a dissident. It's very, very hard to be a dissident in Yugoslavia because radical culture is tolerated. <coughs> It's quite hard to offend. You could offend. And when punk emerged, in, especially in Slovenia in the late 70s, there was sort of soft repression. So there was a, you know, a sun-style disinformation campaign. There were complaints about noise. There was a like, synthetic scandal generated about so-called Nazi punk. Uh, they invented a group called the Fourth Reich, which is basically some teenager writing stuff in his diary. And they made out that this was a dangerous threat to Yugoslavia, etc. So if you really want to challenge or to be radical in Yugoslavia, you can't, you can't go directly against the system. You can't be a dissident in that way. You've got to do something a bit like that other group did and get behind the system and use some of the, the symbolism of power and technology, but then mix it up with all these other elements which are quite unique to our top seer. So, Autopsia was part of the industrial movement. Uh, it was inspired by industrial, inspired by punk, but also by stuff like Dada, by male art, but then other elements as well, which we'll see. So alchemy, Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, biblical texts, Latin quotations, all of this in this unstable, volatile compound. And one of the most interesting features of Autopsia is anonymity. So try having a look online for a photo of a member of Autopsia. It's quite hard. Now other groups, especially in the industrial scene, had a collective name and they tried to keep that anonymity. Autopsia have succeeded. And even in the 80s, that was really valuable as a kind of contrast to the Western star system. But now in our culture, which is so hyper-personalized, so much about uh, you know, gossip, the, the person behind the work, whatever, where is the person behind this? What is the person behind this? It's somebody who came from a rumor, who had that German-Austrian background, had these specialist interests, but what the person is or what their motives are are not so important. So, as I said, you couldn't be a dissident, and this isn't meant to be dissident art, but it is meant to continue what the British industrial groups were doing here and find a, a radical way of jamming culture and trying to cut through the noise of mass culture. Because again, Yugoslavia had a really advanced uh, pop scene of its own. They had all the Western albums, incredibly radical film culture, arguably too intellectual a culture, you know, like so many different theories and different republics, different institutions. Some would be pro-Heidegger, some would be pro-Hegel, some would be Lacanian. So it's this complete Tower of Babel intellectually, but that's really fertile as well. People can really take culture seriously and then transform it into great art. And this has, it does bear the traces of coming from Yugoslavia. Uh, There's a strong influence from Brecht. Uh, this CD, the Berlin Requiem, is a conceptual reconstruction of Brecht's Berlin Requiem from the 20s but in autopsy is on style. Uh, the Frankfurt School, Adorno, <coughs> so that, that sort of critical Marxist tradition, Foucault as well. There are elements of all these things in it, but it's not a leftist project, it's not a rightist project. It's a means of exploring one theme and one theme above all, and the theme is death. So you'll see other motifs, you'll see other subjects, but what autopsy is always returning to again and again is death. And why is it going back to death? It's going back to death as a counterweight to our culture. And it, as I said, I think it's even more relevant now 
than it was when it began to be created in the 80s. So maybe some of you saw about three weeks ago, it was announced that MIT are working on creating avatars of the dead using people's Facebook posts. So the idea is the bereaved will be able to engage with the dead. And be able, it will simulate, based on your posts, a dialogue. So you've had a bad day, you want, you want advice on whether to get married, you can ask granddad online. Avatars of the dead. So there's this abolition of death. And that's got all sorts of problematic aspects to it. So to have a, a project which so explicitly talks about death and put us, uh, puts it at the centre, that's really a huge provocation against our uh, deathless culture and our insistence, or say mainstream official culture's insistence on positivity at all times, on superficiality. Because another aspect of our top seer is that it, by its own confession, it's elitist. It's not interested in whether you understand it. It's not interested in whether you get those references that it's making. If you get the references, great. And I discuss some of the references in the book, not too many, but enough to give an idea. But this is absolutely, this is the antithesis of dumbing down this kind of art. And that's why it's so valuable at the moment. Just a kind of massive contrast to the zeitgeist. And for it to be in London is important because Altopsia had a kind of pre-birth in London in the late 70s. They were getting inspired, seeing all these gigs and beginning to think about what they could do. So it's a way, in a way, a kind of spiritual return home. And London now arguably is maybe on the brink of the kind of change that Yugoslavia was in 79. It could go either way, but there's, there's tension in the air, there's potential for all sorts of things to happen or to go wrong. So it's a really interesting time for this to be here. So has anyone got any burning questions about basics, Yugoslavia, what Altopsia is? If not, then I'm, I'm going to take you around and we'll look at some of the works here and then just explore some of the key symbols and motifs. So this series here, and have a look at these afterwards if you can't all see them now. This is a series of uh, private editions. So a bit like the mail art scene that it was part of. You know, there'd be lots of private publications, uh, editions of one, editions of two, editions of three, really close, private, esoteric production. And all these have the theme of prayer, get it, in German. So, it's, it's, Altopsia has this uh, sacral or mystical atmosphere, but combined with or through the technical elements, so through technical diagrams or through Nikola Tesla's designs, which we'll see over there, um, and through craft and through industrial tools. So in Rume, there was a big workshop full of German machinery. So these people were growing up with that technical legacy of the 20s and 30s. And a lot of these recently have been um, making gold-plated objects. There's another one over there, the cog wheel. And it's a nice paradox because industrial, as a music or a culture, it should actually be grimy or dirty. But these are pristine, these are gold-plated. So that's another nice way of resisting the genre that it's best known as being part of. So Altopsia's music is best known as part of the industrial scene, especially in the first 15 years or so. But there's always been the classical elements, Baroque elements, uh, Renaissance medieval elements, choral elements, and then recently 12-tone uh, music, even dubstep. So all blended in. So. It's, it's much more than just an industrial project. So it's within the industrial networks, but it's something else at the same time. So come and have a look at these in detail, because they're really interesting. Then we should look at the shirts here. And I'm not doing this as a salesman, because these are not my shirts. Um, these are actually Czech military shirts. So from the Cold War period, um, some of them are Czech, Slovak, uh, airborne units. And it's got the repetition of autopsia motifs, so I am the resurrection. <laughs> so this is a nice illustration of another more hidden aspect of autopsia, which is a sly humour. So 
it seems really funereal, it seems deadly serious most of the time, it seems really terrifying, bombastic, but there's actually something else going on. There's a very dry kind of irony. And if you look through these, a lot of these have got different motifs, and you'll see this heraldic shield, which I started very, using very early. That's in some of the works over there as well. And there's, there's a, say, a core set of about 10 different symbols and motifs that you see again and again, especially the lightning flash, heraldic shield, the flame, the skull. They'll come back again and again. And just through repetition, a bit like other industrial groups, you get that mystifying effect. What's it actually mean? Why are they constantly repeating this? Why is it now appearing in a different context? And again, that's for you to try and work out. It's, a, it's meant to inspire thought, and it's meant to give a different perspective. It's not there to be accessible. It's not user-friendly. So let's move along. So, and you'll have to look at these afterwards in detail, but there's a graphic here, a bloodied skull. And this is really typical of the industrial graphic the punk graphics of the early 80s. And you can see what they're coming out of in that way. And then you've got uh, chemical diagrams. You've got custom-made knives with German inscriptions on. Nice one I like here is Aufklärung, Enlightenment. And that's <coughs> interesting because, in a way, autopsia is the opposite of Enlightenment. You know, from an orthodox Marxist perspective, this is not Enlightenment, this is anti-Enlightenment because it's bringing back... Gnosticism, alchemy, all this stuff from the underworld, which science and technology is supposed to have abolished. This is supposed to be past its sell-by date. But actually, all the groups in Yugoslavia that were using this kind of occult mystical symbolism in the 80s, that was a kind of prediction of what was coming. So what happened in Serbia, especially from the late 80s under Milosevic, you got people restaging medieval games. So it's a knockout style TV games, but in medieval Serbian costume, which is, you know, that didn't exist until late 80s. And this kind of thing was already picking up what was in the zeitgeist. It could see the way things were going, let's see. So here, this is a really interesting piece. You've got Praga Medicina Catholica. Because this event is supported by the by Czech publisher, Divas, and by the Czech Centre. And when the war broke out in 91, the main member of Altofsir was in Prague on holiday and then stayed. So claimed asylum, didn't go back to the war, didn't go back to Yugoslavia. So Altofsir has operated mainly in Prague since 91. So it's now got this other identity. It's become Czech, Central European. And on quite a few of the works, you can see this stamp, Praga Medicina Catholica. And you have a little grail, and you have the autopsy of flame. So then you're getting another layer of meaning. You're getting Catholic symbolism alongside Gnosticism, all these other sources, uh, the technical diagrams. I mean, these are great examples. And these, these are graphic scores. So he's following the tradition of avant-garde composers post-war, and then adding all these really... <coughs> mystical details, uh, details of geographical textbooks or all sorts of uh, seismic diagrams, lots of details, architectural structures, and then overprinting the slogans or flames or lots of random details. And this is a really nice retro early image. Uh, so you have this old-fashioned style telephone set and the, the uh, chemical bottle and you have an ancient, uh, probably 30s, again, one of these Austrian adverts. So it's a really nice um, embryonic stage when they're trying to work out a defined identity. So this is still a bit more amateur, a bit more punk. It's still in the process of becoming fixed or monumental. And here's one of the most important people. Does anybody know or recognize who this is? Some of you will know. The Yugoslavs who know this is? OK, this is Nikola Tesla. And this was from a Yugoslav banknote, uh, which I think was issued in 71. And Tesla, he was a pioneer of technology, but if you go online and you Google Tesla, you will find a huge amount of pseudo-mystical 
speculative theories. I mean, theories about him being, you know, slowly assassinated or being frozen out, or all these conspiracies, um, all this speculation about what he did or didn't discover and what he wasn't allowed to to actually go ahead with. Um, links to the heart technology in Alaska. You know, it's it's just a he's an occult figure actually. Officially, he's a scientist. He's respectable, but there's this whole occult vortex around him. So he's a good example of how Autopsia take a figure like Brecht, and they're, they're not just quoting his work, they're quoting the way that his work is understood, and this, this miasma around him, all these associations, all these legends, all these stories. So here we've got another one of the key images, the cogwheel and the lightning flash. And this is Palladium, which is one of the most important works from 91 album, but they were already using it as a motif. And like a lot of these groups, they start using a slogan or a motif, and it, then it becomes a project or an album years later. So they're already laying the groundwork at that time. And this is quite a rare slogan when they're actually talking explicitly about industrialism. Then we've got a lot of... Uh, Details from medical diagrams, um, anatomy, these kind of elements. I mean, look at these in detail because there's so many interesting elements, and, they, and these are all quite old. You know, you don't see this kind of craftsmanship now. Now, talking about Palladium, this is a really nice thing. You've got the uh, the cogwheel again, and then you've got the German slogan Abfall, Abfall und Aufstieg, and that became one of the titles on the Palladium album in '91. Now, that wasn't the first Autopsy album that I bought, but I bought it in an interesting time. I bought it in a shop called uh, These Records, in Elephant and Castle, who, had, uh, who were legendary for their customer service skills. Um, some of us enjoyed it. Um, and I remember going in there and I, I played a couple of Autopsy and I got the comment, well, all your stuff is very droney, isn't it? And that was obviously not a good thing to be, so I promptly bought the two CDs. Um, anyway, I bought Palladium in March 99, and it was about five days before the attack on Yugoslavia began. So at that time, I was finishing my PhD on the other Yugoslav industrial group. Who are they? Um, um, uh, Plavi Orchestra, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was doing all that during the day, and I was following the news from Yugoslavia. I knew people in Novi Sad were being bombed. And I was listening to this repeatedly. It's a really epic, um, symphonic work. And it was done in the studios of Radio Novi Sad in the late 80s. And cultural spending in Yugoslavia, the budgets were huge. So uh, Radio Belgrade, they had, I think they bought the first EMS synthesizer in the world, was installed in Radio Belgrade. They were really advanced. So that's what I was saying earlier about the radical culture, a group like Autopsia, could get state recording facilities. And they could take over the radio's recording studio, and just like the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in the 60s, they could run reel-to-reel -reel tapes right around the, the complex to the point that people couldn't get by. So it's an incredible album, and all done pretty much by hand. There's a bit of live timpani on it, but it's a tape loop work. And I'm influenced because I was listening to it in 99 with the, that stage of the war going on. But if you think about it, it came out in 91 just before the war broke out in Yugoslavia and it was recorded as Yugoslavia was moving in that direction. And like some of the works at that time, it had that feeling of imminent catastrophe. It's not, this is not to say that it's prophetic, but it's a very interesting document of that time and space. And, what was beginning to appear on the horizon. So what else have we got here? Um, yeah, I mean more, this is actually, it looks like some kind of occult figure, but it's actually from an um, art portraiture textbook from Yugoslavia. And then again, these odd technical details. And here's one of the other main slogans, 20th century is dead. So remember, they're saying this in 80 or 81, when Yugoslavia, Tito's just died, but Yugoslavia is still presenting itself as this incredibly advanced and futuristic civilization. 
and this is only in 1980, but they're already saying 20th century is dead. And they're already seeing through the model of total progress that we're now structured by even more. And then you've got, again, Alf Clarung, the Enlightenment. This is interesting, in hoc, in hoc signal vinces. So in this sign we triumph. And funny enough, that same slogan was used by another anonymous project from Holland, Bunker Records, who you also use a black cross. And that is all about anonymity as well. So it, that's a ni very nice slogan for these groups that want to get beyond personality, get beyond the individual. Here, this piece and this piece, we've got the Catholic side coming to the surface much more explicitly. So you've got the, the two sacred hearts. And then you've got the cogwheel, which does appear in a lot of works. But in some works, you've got the crucified Christ on the cogwheel. So you've got the Catholic industrial <coughs> collision working in a really interesting way. And this is uh, Soviet avant-garde architect Chernikov, who did a lot of virtual radical architecture but wasn't built. Um, if he'd been operating in Yugoslavia in the 60s or the 70s, his stuff would surely have been built. And there would have been massive money for it. This, this would have been a, a Yugoslav memorial in that period. Um, yeah, so let's move around. And bear in mind, I've been following Altops here for a long time and quite a few of his works I've never seen before. And all of these were produced in that decade as Yugoslavia was moving towards war. So quite interesting pieces. Um, here you've got the Let's the God, the Last God, and then you've got the circuit diagram. So again, talking about mysticism and technology. Again, 20th century is dead. Medicina Catholica Prague and Jesuila Resurrection. Heretical, bold statement. And then you've got the medieval elements as well, the neoclassical elements. And this, you know, very, again, very provocative use of old material, move away from modernism. Then here, an anatomical diagram, German inscriptions, more technical diagrams. And this, this is really interesting. The skeletal archer. So the archer is ready for battle, but he's died being ready for battle. He will never go into battle. And there's another image you can see um, of a, a running dog, also skeletal, but still casting a shadow, which is over there. And then this is interesting, the lightning flash. Because, of course, the group best known for the lightning flash is Robin Gristle. And they were referring more to the British Union of Fascists and that iconography. But autopsy is influenced by them in a certain way. But the way they're using it, it's much more, it's the, you know, the international symbol for danger, high voltage, for power. But because it's mixed up with all these occult elements, it's saying technology is dangerous in more than one sense. It's not just that it can literally kill you, but it's almost as if there's an awareness that hyper-sophistication, hyper-rationalism can produce the opposite. So in a way, Yugoslavia, one of the, the agonies or the problems of Yugoslavia wasn't that it was too primitive, it was too sophisticated. There were too many conflicting messages, too, many, uh, too much radical architecture. You know, and even in the 60s, there were sociological surveys saying that most of the Yugoslav population they were getting left behind. They were quite alienated by a lot of the, the radical buildings, the radical music, whatever. They weren't going on that journey. And it's a bit like the, the difference between London and the rest of the country over Brexit. There's a cultural lag, and it just gets worse and worse. And if any of you have seen the, uh, the famous BBC documentary, Serbian Epics, and I will now mention the other group, Leibach. Um, there's a Leibach documentary from 92. And Zizek made this famous statement, we on Balkan, we in the Balkans, we are the future. So, you know, he was saying, don't, you know, 
you in the West don't be sick of, don't be sick of, so complacent. Don't think that by having advanced technology or by having a, a really uh, thriving intellectual culture that you're immune. It can happen to you as well. So that's the emphasis on death and the emphasis on the, the dangers of technology and the mystical potential of technology. We can relate that to a lot of what's going on now, post-truth politics, rise of new barbarism, etc. Because Yugoslavia went through that agony, that agony already a long time ago. They know. So there are actually coded warnings here if you want to take them. And you know, think about the implications of these works. Now, going back to Tesla, you can see here some of Tesla's uh, coil diagrams for electrical transmission systems. But if you don't know what these are, if you don't know what Tesla's diagrams look like, it doesn't, it's odd. It doesn't look like, you know, a component. It looks somehow conceptual, somehow artistic or poetic. <coughs> so Altopsiri are playing with that aspect of Tesla, the kind of mystical side and the fact that there was always something else going on be besides science. Or even he was, he was a mystic who was going through technology to get to his mystical goal. It wasn't really about the technology in some ways. Anyway, you remember I mentioned bunk the bunker in Bosnia where Tito and his people would have held out? In 2011, the first Biennale was held inside the bunker. So the bunker is now, it's still a military object. So you still need permission, you still need to go through checkpoints. The Bosnian army control it. But you've got to get permission to go in there. And that's now a center use for art. So you go through the blast tunnel, and it's full of art. And this was produced for the, two, the second edition in 2013. So right in the depths of this bunker, um, full of works, you know, really art artistic arsenal is what it's become. And this is the newest piece in this exhibition. And it's, it's, of course, it's going back to the cog wheel. It's going back to its old themes, but doing it in a new way. And again, the gold plating gives it an interesting new element. And then finally, Altopsir is also poetry. So before Altopsir was making music, before it was producing graphics, they were writing poetry. And they were also influenced by Burroughs and by Cut-Up. So they were combining different phrases, different sentences into new formations. So have a look at the slogans because they're quite interesting, makes you think. And look in the books there as well. You see quite a lot of different unexpected um, uh, combinations. There's a lot of German. And like Leibach, Atopsia don't speak German. They're using German as a ready-made. And it's a ready-made because Yugoslavia was quite German-influenced, although that was repressed. But a lot of Yugoslavs were working in Germany or in Austria. They were going there to shop. They were traveling back. Uh, craft work was really important in Yugoslavia. So it was there. But they're not doing it. If you look at this, you might think this is some kind of Germanophile, affirmative use of German. But it's not. It's, it's using German as a raw material to sculpt with. And they're playing with the, the kind of fear of German, the traumas of the German language, but also the poetic side of, of uh, Brecht, his poetry, and other German cultural figures. So that illustrates how Yugoslavia was poised in between the Germanic and the Slavic worlds. It wasn't fully part of either. And Prague as well, it's Central European. So you've got Kafka, who's not German, but who writes in German, and he twists the German language also like Leibach do. So that makes it really interesting the way they use the language. And then, yeah, I mean, equations, cog wheels. But this is quite rare because it's actually using Serbian. And generally, there's not so much in Serbian. It's mostly English or German, or sometimes Latin when they're making the alchemy references or Rosicrucianism. But there is some Serbian and it is partly a Slavic project. So I think that's probably enough of me droning on, but I'm really happy to take questions. Um, if you're completely confused, don't know what the hell is going on or why you're here, 
come to me and I will try and put you right. Um, so you can ask me individually or as a group now as you prefer. Um, and stick around because you will hear some unreleased Autopsia audio, which is getting its premiere tonight. Not live, but there will be some new things which have not been heard before to listen to. Um, have a browse of the books um, and look at these in detail. It's on all next week, uh, I think 12 to 6, it's like 10 to 6, uh, and tomorrow. But after that, it's gone. And there may not be Autopsy here in London again. So this is your chance. Look at this stuff in detail. Form your own relation to it. And uh, enjoy. Thanks. Yeah.